Hi everybody, here's your reading for today and we're reading chapter 10. Very exciting chapter in my opinion. Enjoy! The hallowed shallows were crowded with rambling aisles now, hundreds of them, some large, some small. They seemed to be waiting for something. Oliver waited too. Dangling from the thirlstone's brow, his glass globe swinging to and fro in its creaking basket of ropes. When would the judging begin? Stacy de Lacey was running about busily on the thirlstone's head, shouting orders at his monkeys while they did a bit of last minute polishing and tidied scraps of sea wig that had been blown skewiff by the wind. At last, on the far horizon, a tiny speck appeared drawing quickly closer. The islands all mumbled and muttered to each other, turning to look. Soon Oliver could see that the approaching thing was another rambling isle, striding purposefully through the waves. On either side of it, the wave crests foamed and the foam took on the form of galloping horses. It was the chief island who had won the last night of the sea wigs. The white horses of the sea formed an honour guard for her and the mermaids on the singing rocks started to sing again, properly now that they didn't have Iris helping. The chief island, her name was Dambule, waded into the shallows and stopped. On her summit towered a massive wig of trees and flowers and grasses with rainbows knotted in it and the prows of Viking longships jutting out like ornate hairpins. She looked at her fellow islands with pride and sadness and then quickly shook her head so that the old wig came apart, the rainbows drifting away, the rotten timbers of the old ships tumbling down her sides into the sea. Ah, said the rambling isles, and ooh! Even the thirlstone made a deep rumbling sound out of respect for Dambule's wonderful wig. Never mind, said Dambule sadly. It was a good wig. But it was old and now I can start again and collect a whole new one. But first we must see who here has the finest sea wig. Which of us has found the prettiest things on their wanderings? Who shall be the winner tonight and chief island for the next seven years? The islands shifted a little. The ones whose wigs were really poor or had suffered in the wind, slunk backwards into deeper water. Some eyed up the drifting bits of Dambule's wig that still bobbed up on the waves, wondering if they could make some last minute changes without the others noticing. The prouder ones preened themselves, hoping to attract the voters of their neighbours. The islands with the wig of drizzled sand drew many admiring looks. So did another which had a crown of whale bones, but none could compare with the splendour of the Thirlstone, with its shipwrecks and those three glass globes from which three captive humans gawped. One by one, the islands turned until they were all gazing at it. Oliver, trapped in his hanging globe, pounded his hands against the inside of the glass and shouted, No, it's not fair! The Thirlstone cheated! But the mermaids were singing still and their voices drowned out his protests. His parents waved and shouted too, but the rambling isles thought they were only pleading for their freedom. Captive humans, how original! No island had worn captive humans for centuries! Thirlstone! said one of the isles in a deep, rumbly voice. Thirlstone, said another, softer. Thirlstone, cried a third in a voice like the boom of surf in deserted coves. Iris popped up beside the Thirlstone's left knee, (laughs) red-faced and breathless. After her hasty swim from the reef, she pointed up at the isle and shouted, but there was no way she could make herself heard over the voices of the rambling isles. Thirlstone, Thirlstone, Thirlstone. Even the one with the wig of whale bones, who had been hoping to win, saw which way the tide was running and added his voice to those of the others. Thirlstone, let Thirlstone be the winner. Just then, the song of the mermaids rode into a wild crescendo and suddenly Iris saw how she might be able to save Oliver and his family, even if all else was lost. 
she took a deep breath and sang the same note she had sung for the merman choir master a few moments before she sang louder this time as loud as she as sh and as shrill as she could she sang till her face turned purple before her voice had been enough to break the mermaid's mirrors this time it made the rambling owls clap their hands over their ears and put the other mermaids off their song oliver swinging in his globe saw a fine frost of cracks start to spread across the glass crash smash the three globes shattered icefalls of glass cascaded down the thirlstone's cliffs into the sea dropped mr and mrs crisp but what of oliver iris peered about trying not to be distracted by the hoots of the angry islands who were all outraged that a mere mermaid had dared to interrupt that solemn moment Ah, there he was, clinging to a root which jutted from the thirlstone's rocky forehead. But just as Iris saw him, a great smother of foam came down on her. The thirlstone turned towards her, swirling the skirts of the sea. Iris darted out of the way as the thirlstone's huge foot tried to squash her. She plunged down under it almost to the silver sand of the sea floor, and then rose up on the other side. As she broke the surface there, Mr Culpepper came flapping over her, squawking. Here they are! She saw Mr and Mrs Crisp clinging together, tossed up and down like two corks on the waves, which the angry island was creating. She seized each of them by the hand and swam them with them to calmer water. But Oliver knew nothing about any of this clutching at roots and rocky pimples. He had heaved himself back up the Fethelstone steep face. There he saw sea monkeys running in every direction, while furious Stacy de Lacey kicked them about like furry green footballs. It's all gone wrong, Stacy raged. We'll be disqualified unless... Gah! roared the Fethelstone. Other islands blundered away from it, scared of its rage and the way it lashed its clumsy stone fists about like massive ha hammers. Stacy de Lacey scrambled onto his viewing platform on the island's brow and grabbed his loud hailer. The Thirlstone is still the winner, he bellowed. You chose him and he won fair and square. And now you'd better do what he says or my monkeys will come and mess your wigs up. Sea monkeys spilled down the Thirlstone's face like a river of snot. They spread across the ocean, gibbering with wild glee as the waves lifted them up and down. But above the shouting of Stacy de Lacey and the roars of the Thirlstone, the hoots of frightened isles and the squeals of the monkeys, a new voice boomed out. Stop it! Stop! it said. The rambling isles looked round. The monkeys too. Even the Thirlstone stopped roaring and glanced over its huge stone shoulder. Another rambling isle had arrived. A small shabby isle with nothing on its head but the sad remnants of a not very good wig and a confused narwhal which it had just scooped up. At the sight of him, Iris jumped clean out of the water and turned a cartwheel above the crisp's bewildered heads. Oliver, looking down from the Thirlstone's brow, grinned a great grin to himself and whispered, Cliff! Cliff stood up as tall as he could and the narwhal fell off his head. He shook a fist at the Thirlstone and shouted something about stolen ships and kidnappings, but the surf was busting around him, bursting around him, and all that most of his listeners heard was blargle. Oliver, from his high vantage point, could see that the poor island's knees were knocked together. But still, Cliff stood his ground as the Thirlstone, with seabed-shaking stomps, strode angrily towards him. Poor Cliff! All the way from the sarcastic sea! He had kept telling himself that his fellow rambling isles would help to teach the Thirlstone a lesson. Now he could see that they were all as scared of it as he was. As they edged nervously away, he realised that he was going to have to face it alone, which was very bad, because the Thirlstone was bigger and stronger and fiercer than Cliff, 
and up on its head, Stacy delaces with yellow. Smash him, Thirlstone. Bash him up. Stamp him down. Leave him alone, shouted Oliver, jumping from his hiding place. A monkey drum rolled past him as the Thirlstone lurched towards Cliff and Oliver snatched it and flung it to Stacy de Lacey. It missed, but it made Stacy look round and he forgot about Cliff and charged angrily at Oliver instead. Oliver ran away from him, zigzagging between the trees, looking for something he could use to defend himself. Near the pool by the temple, he found one of the peacock feather fans lying where a careless monkey had dropped it. It looked a flimsy, feather dustery sort of thing, but he picked it up anyway. That was when the idea came to him. He could hear Stacy de Lacey panting through the trees behind him, spluttering threats and curses. The ground beneath him shivered as the thirlstone let out another cry of rage. Oliver ran between the trees to where one of those fissures opened, the cracks which led down into the island's hollow inside. He took a deep breath and jumped in. Dump, bump, crash. He went, bruising himself as he tumbled down through the stony tubes and crannies. He snatched at out juttings of rock to slow himself, and the thirlstone flinched just as it had before. How could something so big and stony be so ticklish? Oliver wondered. And what would happen when he really started tickling? He found a foothold, raised his feather fan and set to work. The thirlstone swung, a huge fist at Cliff. Cliff ducked and the blow missed by a whisker. The thirlstone growled and rumbled, readying itself to strike again. But suddenly it stopped. Something was moving inside it. Something that tickled. It writhed. A shipwreck dropped off its wig and splashed into the sea. And the thirlstone, or something, along those lines. Another ship fell, the water mole this time. It landed near the spot where Mr and Mrs Crisp were treading water, and Iris hustled them aboard. Stop it, howled the thirlstone, but Oliver wouldn't stop. Deep in the bad old isle's insides, he tickled, and he tickled mercilessly, jabbing his feather fan into all the cracks and fissures he could reach, wriggling and jiggling it there. The thirlstone clutched its sides and howled. It stumbled and staggered, throwing up sheets of spray, making waves which slapped against the faces of the other rambling isles and rocked the water mole and her passengers wildly up and down. A stone head tumbled off the thirlstone's summit. A few last sea monkeys jumped off the cliffs like rats abandoning a sinking ship, cannonballing into the water. The ancient temple quivered, cracked, crumbled. Bits and pieces of it cascaded past the thirlstone space to smash into the water. Other bits of his wigs came loose too, wreaths of seaweed, boulders, trees. You vandal, Stacy de Lacey screamed, dodging a toppling stone head and shouting down the crack that Oliver had vanished into. You spoil sport, you're ruining everything. Down beneath his feet, Oliver just went on tickling and tickling until with a creak, a black crack opened, splitting the thirlstone summit in two. Other smaller cracks spread out from it. Stacy de Lacey watched in horror as they surrounded him. More creaks and groans and straining sounds filled the air. The thirlstone had quaked and quivered and shuddered and shaken so much that it was coming completely to pieces. Down on the water, Iris and the crisps watched cracks cover the thirlstone's stupid startled face like a black net. Then, in a slither of shards and a cloud of dust and upflung spray, the rambling isle exploded. For a moment, they saw Stacy de Lacey clinging to the top of one great fragment, yelling as it toppled. For a moment, they thought they saw Oliver tumbling free, with a big feather fan flapping like a wing above him. Then the spray hid everything. Oliver hit the water hard as the thirlstone came apart around him. He plunged deep enough to brush his fingers over the silver sand beneath and came up gasping for air. He trod water and looked around. While the upflung spray fell on the waves like rain, 
There was no thirlstone any more, only a few scattered chunks, small islets, whose head barely poked above the, the waters, even here in the shallows. One by one, they opened like black beady eyes of their own and blinked. They were brand new, rambling isles, bashful in the presence of so many bigger ones. Oliver laughed, swimming between them, till that ahead of him he saw the water mole, still just floating about, just a, still about, still just about afloat, with his mum and dad and Iris, and Mister Culpepper all waving at him from its upper deck. Iris pulled him aboard, and he ran and hugged mum, then dad. The ancient submarine submarine was sinking fast, but Cliff waded over and supported it before it could settle to the sea floor. Wow. That was really amazing, said a strand of sarcastic seaweed hanging down in front of Cliff's face as it sounded, and it sounded as if it really meant it. The other islands shuffled closer, trying to look as if they had been right at Cliff's side all along and not a bit scared of the thirlstone. Some mumbled that Cliff had done well. Others explained that they had never trusted the thirlstone. A few of the quicker thinking ones scooped up bits of the Thirlstone's scattered wig and added them to their own, because it was pretty clear that a new winner would have to be chosen. It was Dambule who first was the first to say thank you. She looked at Iris and Oliver and then at Cliff. Thank you. You have saved us from awarding the greatest honour of our kind to a bad creature who did not deserve it. You have been brave while we were cowardly. What is your name? Cliff, said Cliff, blushing a bit. This is my sea wig, he added, scooping up the water mole and setting it on top of it and top again. The thirlstone stole it from me. There were some other bits too, but they got lost. The rambling isles all looked at him. The water mole did not look nearly as splendid on top of Cliff as it had when the thirlstone wore it, the strands of weed which he had carried with him from the sarcastic sea did their best to look decorative, and Mr Culpepper perched on the watermill's bow with his wings outspread. But it still looked a bit shabby and scruffy. Even so, Dambule turned to the other islands and said, I think it's clear what we must do. Cliff is the bravest of us, and his seawig is certainly the most interesting. He is the winner of this night of the seawigs. Yay! shouted Iris and Oliver and Mr Culpepper. Mr and Mrs Crisp clapped politely. They were a bit confused, but they were starting to get the hang of things. Even the weed looked pleased, but Cliff slowly shook his head. Not me, he said. I can't hang around here in the shallows being fettered and fussed over. I don't care about the seaweed competition any more. Let Thrumcat be the winner or Dimsy. I have to take my friends home. Then... With all the other rambling arms looking on, he turned and waded away. Up on his head, Mr and Mrs Crisp fetched out their cameras and took photo after photo of the watching isles and the mermaids. But either because of some magic of the shallows, or because the cameras had been battered too badly during their adventures, not one of those pictures ever came out. As for Oliver... He just clung to the water mole's barnacled rail and stared, trying to take it all in. He saw the unearthly purplish sky and the pale sea, the white horses galloping in the wave crests, the mermaids playing in cliff's wake like dolphins. He saw the rambling isles in all their finery. He did his best to fix it in his mind forever, and unlike the photographs, his memories did come out. He kept them always, and they never faded. Okay, I'm just going to pause there for today and we'll finish off tomorrow. I hope you enjoyed that part of the story. Good job, guys.